Nick Drake was born in Rangoon, Burma on June 19, 1948. While little is known about this reclusive singer-songwriter, his music has become iconic to many, despite the initial lukewarm response he received while he was alive. This is the story of Nick Drake, an extremely fascinating and talented musical figure that, tragically, felt like the puzzle piece that just wouldn't fit during his short life. Nick's father was named Rodney, and he was an engineer. His mother was Molly Lloyd, who was the daughter of a senior member of the Indian Civil Service. Along with older sister Gabrielle, the family primarily resided in Warwickshire, England. The Drake family consisted of multiple musicians, most prominently his mother Molly, who was already an accomplished songwriter and pianist. She had a substantial vinyl record collection that young Nick would get his hands on. These early musical roots would, in time, give way to one of the most misunderstood poets of all time. He would soon begin using Molly's reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, capturing some bits and pieces of songs as he was still learning. He gradually became excellent at piano. Nick attended prep school in Berkshire, and eventually went to Marlborough College in Wiltshire. He was an avid sportsman, he loved sprinting, reading, and was all around a pretty confident young man. In 1965, Nick formed a band with four classmates called the Perfumed Gardeners. Soon after, he bought his first acoustic guitar and began learning. He received a scholarship to Fitzwilliam College in Cambridge, but delayed attendance to travel and practice music. He stayed with his older sister Gabrielle for a brief time. It was also around this time, Nick would begin to experiment with weed and various hallucinogens like LSD, as some of his lyrics alluded to this behavior. By 1968, Nick had all but mastered the guitar, and his skills developed considerably. He began playing at some local coffee shops and clubs. One of his shows at a place called The Roundhouse led to Ashley Hutchings noticing his talent and introducing Nick to producer Joe Boyd. Joe had a connection to Island Records and gave Nick Drake a shot to record his debut. This record would become Five Leaves Left, released on July 3, 1969. Recorded at Sound Techniques in London, Nick Drake's first album is a beautiful introduction to his distinctive sound. Right away, you take notice of Nick's unique voice and the understated, vulnerable, yet confident musicianship. Though I feel Nick would fully find his sound on future releases, Five Leaves Left is an honest, raw album full of haunting strings, sincerity, and pure feeling. Way to Blue showcases how Nick's voice and poetry carried his music while effortlessly being in total unison. Day is Done is short but effective, with the consistently terrific guitar work and string sections that create a very unique concoction of both melancholy and solace. Most of these songs don't inherently sound depressed, rather spiritual and introspective, with gorgeous arrangements and an unmatched sincerity. With some contributions in the studio from Paul Harris, Robert Kirby, and a couple others, Five Leaves Left was completed and released to few sales and little interest. But for those who did hear the record, they knew immediately that Nick Drake was definitely something special. By 1969, Nick had quit his schooling in Cambridge and moved to London. During this time, he was staying on friends' couches and floors with very little stability in his life. Needless to say, it was a pretty confusing time. In August of that year, Nick recorded five songs in a John Peel session, and three songs were broadcasted live. The audience was stoic and unimpressed. They obviously expected bombast choruses and incredible charisma, neither of which Nick could deliver upon at that time. Conflicted and shy, Nick was crushed by the lack of interest in his music. The disappointing reception of his first album, along with the John Peel performance, made Nick take things in a different direction for LP2. He wanted to bring his music to a commercial level. Brighter Later would be LP2, and it was released on March 6, 1971. This record truly transcended its predecessor, with some iconic moments such as the romantic Northern Sky and the rather upbeat tune Hazy Jane 2. Nick sounds a lot more confident here. The songs have more pop sensibility, and Nick has improved as both a vocalist and guitarist. The production is top-notch as well. All three of Nick's studio albums sound like they could be modern releases. The instrumentation is tight, fluid, and sounds very warm on the ears. Brighter Later is simply a gem of a record. Following the release of Brighter Later, it once again was considered a commercial failure. 
This was devastating for Nick. Discouraged, he decided to quit playing live shows, as one of his final performances proved to be quite painful. From here on out, Nick's mental state would only deteriorate, and things got way darker. Nick eventually returned home, and his family persuaded him to see a psychiatrist for his depression. He was promptly prescribed antidepressants. Embarrassed, Nick tried to hide it from friends. He was a regular consumer of weed, and was worried how it would react with the antidepressants. A short time later, Nick would begin to withdraw even more, displaying the first signs of psychosis as described by Robert Kirby. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to what Nick Drake actually suffered from. Some say manic depression, some say it was the drugs. Personally, I believe Nick suffered from schizophrenia, and so did a former therapist of his. His behavior during this time aligns pretty well with the symptoms of schizophrenia. Not taking care of oneself, flat expression, as well as disappearing for long periods of time. It's also most common for schizophrenia to arise in the mid-twenties, which Nick was. He began to isolate himself, only leaving the house to buy drugs. Things were going very wrong, but in the midst of all the pain, Nick showed interest in making a new record. This time around, he opted for a stripped-back approach, without the full instrumentation which accompanied him on earlier albums. This third and final record would become Pink Moon. When Nick came to the label showing interest in making a third album, it was unexpected to say the least. Five Leaves Left and Brighter Later didn't perform well. Also, Nick's lack of interest in doing any promotion whatsoever had soured the label. With some reluctance, the label agreed to put out a new release. Over two or three nights in October of 1971, the entirety of the album was recorded. It was Nick, his guitar, and his poetry at the forefront, aside from some piano on the title track. Pink Moon, released on February 25th, 1972, proved to be the most intimate release of Nick's discography, showing a vulnerable authenticity wrapped in pure, poetic genius. Pink Moon is Nick's masterpiece. This is a very personal release. You can immediately tell he had something to say and get off his chest. From the rather morose parasite to the contemplative place to be, this is a collection of songs straight from the inner workings of a weary mind. Nick Drake really bears his soul on Pink Moon in such a straightforward, honest manner that instantly resonates in a profound way. You could say it's depressing, or you could say it's thought-provoking. Either way, once you begin listening, you begin a very unique personal journey. Pink Moon is a record that definitely needs to be heard in its entirety. By the end, you will come away having gained some type of insight from the words Nick Drake left behind. The closing track, From the Morning, oddly feels like one of the most hopeful. It gives you a comforting feeling, as if everything will be okay in the end, but unfortunately, it wasn't okay for Nick. Pink Moon underperformed, and once again, Drake was extremely disappointed. In the following months, he would disappear for days and show up unannounced at friends' houses. Usually, he was completely silent. Shortly later, he had a nervous breakdown and was hospitalized for about five weeks. Things simply were not going good. However, for a brief time, Nick seemed to have been doing better following his hospital stay. There were talks of Nick recording a fourth album, and a recording session took place in July of 1974. Nothing ever came to fruition. Relationship issues with then-love interest Sophia Ride contributed to even more frustration and depression within Nick. In the early hours of November 25, 1974, Nick Drake was found dead in his room due to an overdose on his antidepressants. Nick Drake's music has only become known in the years following his death. His influence can still largely be felt to this day, and his records that flopped back then have since become classics. A number of posthumous albums have been released in honor of Nick, including Time of No Reply in 1987, Made to Love Magic in 2004, and a few others. They contained outtakes and previously unheard cuts from Nick's final recording session, such as Black Eyed Dog. It's easy to view Nick Drake's life through the lens of melodrama and tragedy, but at the end of the day, you have to remember that he was a real human being that had problems just like the rest of us. People tend to highlight his moments of darkness, and it's a real shame that his music almost takes backseat to the mystery surrounding his early death. 
he has essentially become a musical martyr, among the likes of Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, and Elliot Smith. Mystique aside, Nick Drake was the definition of a real artist. He boasted authenticity, passion, honesty, and raw talent that has solidified him as one of history's greatest musicians. The real tragedy is that he never got to experience any recognition for his genius. At the very least, Nick's memory has been kept alive through his music that continues to inspire many. His story will definitely live on. I hope you enjoyed the video. What's your favorite Nick Drake song? Leave a comment down below. Discussion is always encouraged. More music-related content coming soon here on The Music Narrative.